Scientists find that we fall in love in steps. First, we enjoy this certain person's company. We begin to pay attention to every detail of their movement and behavior, and soon we can think of nothing else besides this person. We have a tender first kiss, which we might replay in our mind every few seconds through the next week. During each replay in our mind, we see the other's face and feel the soft press of lips. We are unable to focus on our work except for 10 seconds out of every three minute period, and we can't sleep. Scientists find that the chemical oxytocin is being produced and released within our brains. It is enabling this extraordinary power of concentration and is forging our love. We are now fiercely smitten. The beauty of this person becomes more pronounced and we become unaware of the existence of all other persons. Everything around us that used to be dull and boring suddenly takes on a new brightness. We notice new details in an old familiar song. Finally, we never want to be away from this person. We feel that the universe was made for the two of us and that compared to love, what does the universe matter? Without our love, there would be no universe. Notice that as you replay in your mind the sight of the other person's face and the press of your lips that no words are being spoken, the feeling you are experiencing is older than words. For a few million years, our ancestors were falling in love and being in love without holding a single conversation. As you hug your loved one, you feel as if you have everything needed in life. Everything else in the world seems to evaporate and your troubles disappear. The comfort you feel at that moment has been occurring during such hugs for millions of years. It is an emotional packet that travels through time connecting you with distant ancestors as you share common thoughts and experiences. The same portion of DNA in each of you is producing the oxytocin for the same reason. Fully developed speech consisting of thousands of words, began only about 50,000 years ago, but we have been a monogamous species for more than one million years. As you fall in love with your lifelong spouse, which of the above steps to falling in love do you think could happen without any words at all? As infants, we learn language by carefully watching the things our family and group members are doing as they are speaking. We are tuned to many contextual and gestural clues that accompany their words. For example, the toddler notices that every time a person leaves he or she says bye, the actual sound or word that is made does not matter. It is different in each place around the planet. We could just as well communicate the departure by tilting our head, clapping, or pulling our ear. The child will do the same. The toddler also notices that every time a ball is held, a certain word is said. Within a few years, the child has noticed several hundred such pairings of words in events or objects. Children learn by hearing the words that accompany actions. As an infant, we spend hundreds of hours learning to manipulate the 75 muscles that make our tongue throat, and lips alter puffs of air to produce strings of alternating consonants and vowels. Children soon take the production of speech for granted in the same way they take breathing for granted. We speak effortlessly and forget how complicated it really is. By the way, it also took a few hundred hours of effort for you to learn to walk, dance, throw, catch, or do algebra and such. Once learned, these things are automatically done with little thought. While we are struggling to learn, new neuronal connections are being made in our brain. We are changing our brain as we learn. When traveling in foreign countries, I cannot believe the rate at which one person produces funny sounds and another person comprehends them. Each local group of people have a mutual consensus on the sound of speech that will communicate every specific word. Our use of language is a large part of being human, but here too we are not all that different from our other primates and animals.
The Bonobo chimpanzee Kanzi learns several hundred words the same way by being surrounded by people since birth and by watching and listening to them as they are doing things. Kanzi understands spoken English. For example, in the kitchen, a person can say Kanzi, wash the potatoes and put them in the pan, or put the green box in the refrigerator, and he will. Kanzi also communicates with a lexigram board. When new scientists join the team working with Kanzi, it takes them one year to learn the hundreds of symbols on the lexigram board. Kanzi understands several hundred spoken words. Banana. Banana. Very nice. Banana. Banana. Can you find peanuts? Peanut. Thank you. Will you find eggs? Sherman. Egg. Good. Can you find milk? Milk. Milk. Good. How about apple? Apple. Very good. How about Sue? Sue. Very good. Can you find peanuts? Peanut. Very nice. Peanut. How about eggs? Egg. Egg. Great, Kanzi. How about chow? Have you had any chow in a while? Has he had chow lately? Chow. You might have to have some chow. chow. Yeah, you think so? I could give you a piece of chow. chow. That would be good, wouldn't it? How about, let's see, tomato. 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 Yeah, let's go on the keyboard too. There. Can you find onions? Onion. Good. Potato. Potato. Blueberries. Blueberry. How about good? Good. Good. That's right. Just go ahead and hit it. Good. Very good. Good. Sure, good boy. How about, let's see, strawberries. Can you find strawberries? Strawberries. Very nice. Bunny. Can you find bunny? Bunny. Good. What do we human beings most often use our precious language to talk about? Studies find that two-thirds of our conversation is used to talk about each other. We are social creatures. Of the one billion words in the dictionary, the most common words used in our conversations include person, child, man, woman, time, day, year, week, thing, world, life, hand. Agree on the words used to vocalize feelings, actions, and thoughts. We experience a feeling and then to verbalize it, we search from a list of words others have used when expressing what we think likely had a similar feeling for them. For example, being exhilarated, feeling dread, or anxiousness. Notice words are not needed to experience our feelings or to choose actions. We are adept at noticing what others are doing or feeling, and what they are saying while they are doing or feeling it. We have an innate predisposition to learn and to use complex language, but the specific form of that language is not preset within our genes. We might learn either to speak Farsi or to sign Italian. It has also been found out that if during childhood we are not surrounded by other people and so do not have the opportunity to learn language by the age of 10 or so, then we will never learn language. We also have an innate predisposition to form culture, but the details of that culture are not genetically predetermined. We have developed a hardwired circuit, our inner voice within our brain that instantly and automatically produces the word to accompany the sight of every object, whether we want it or not. Persons who are deaf at birth and learn sign language during childhood develop an inner sign rather than an inner voice.
As we recall, an image of an apple, we see an object that is sort of round and maybe red. Notice that it takes some effort to concentrate on that image to add the details of its appearance. The stem and that fuzzy stuff at its bottom, the detours from roundness, the exact color and the graduations in color are added to our image only if we concentrate. Our brain functions by creating interior representations of external events. A real apple does not exist within our head, but only a mentally generated representation of one. This makes it less surprising that nightmare troubled children and schizophrenics believe that the monsters they see in their heads are real. As we mentally picture an apple, it seems to be as real as any other. Our brain defines who we are, and it produces our view of the world around us. For thousands of years, people have wondered what is going on inside our brain the instant before an idea pops into our head. Scientists now use MRI machines to measure the pop as it develops in a split second. A person is placed in the machine and then asked to picture, for example, an apple. Within the person's brain, there are at first very few neurons involved, but with mental concentration, the number keeps growing. When a great enough number of neurons have become involved, we feel that we have just had an entire thought. Our thought process involves growing regions of neuronal activity. Our lifelong consciousness really consists of a series of individual five-second awarenesses, one after another. That is, we will consider one thing for about five seconds, and then we go on to consider something else for five seconds. You might like to keep track of the sequence of thoughts that you have during a one-minute period. This means that the present lasts for about five seconds. Two weeks are needed for our brain to adjust to a big change in life, such as getting married, joining the army, going to prison, or moving to a boarding school. The brain soon decides that the new situation is now the normal one. Our brain is naturally adept at handling the situations that our ancient biological ancestors continually encountered through the generations, including those of our socially cooperating and mutually beneficial group. For example, we effortly notice the simultaneous absence of a certain man or woman. Our brain makes predictions of the behavior of the others within our social group. We think in terms of social costs paid and not paid, and of benefits accepted or denied. We do not seek the absolute best solution because we do not have the time to consider every detail of every option. We instead seek the most overall beneficial choice that can be made quickly. We jump to a decision that feels right. That is more important to us than finding the most logical solution. Our feelings amplify one criterion over another and assign weights to each alternative. Have you noticed the inner feeling of pleasantness or unpleasantness you have while mentally selecting from a list of options? For example, while simply choosing what to eat for lunch, we perform a series of mental steps. We think of one food, develop a feeling for it, gauge the level of goodness or badness of that feeling, think of another food, develop a feeling for this one, gauge the level of goodness or badness of this feeling, and then select that food which provided the most positive inner feeling. We make larger decisions in the same way. We do this when choosing between jobs and cities. The weighting of feelings is done within the cingulate gyrus. We are constantly surrounded by thousands of things, but pay attention only to those that we deem to be of biological importance, because they can impact our life. You might see buildings, trees with swaying leaves, blowing grass, gliding birds, airplane tracks in the sky, a line of ants, Two persons conversing, a leaking faucet, a mother and daughter walking, a parked bicycle, 
an ambulance, a restaurant, a big dog roaming, a coin, an attractive person, and some traffic. We are surrounded by a continual barrage of events. Our feelings serve to greatly amplify the importance of those events that are biologically relevant to us and help us ignore the others so that we are hardly conscious of them. For example, mates and predators are biologically important to us while the motion of wind-blown grass is not. The tiny cut caused by the doctor's needle does no damage, but our feelings greatly amplify the perceived importance of this. An event is not remembered if it warrants no feeling. You probably don't remember the fallen twig you passed last week. Things producing strong feelings are never forgotten. Our inner feelings help us to learn and to remember. Each event in life, the entire sensed environment of sight, sound, taste, smell, and touch is stored in our memory. We also store our inner feeling of pleasantness or unpleasantness for each event. We not only remember each experience but also the feeling we were having as it occurred. Just as we have an inner voice that produces the name of each item seen, we also have an inner feeler. You cannot turn off either of these. Early in life each situation is new to us. After gathering some experience, we avoid those situations or behaviors that produce a bad feeling and repeat those that produce a good feeling. Our religious sages urge that each night you should review the day's thoughts and actions and repeat those that made you happy while avoiding those that did not. While choosing a response to a situation, the brain circuit in the cingulate gyrus performs a summed average of innate reactions, predispositions of mental recollections, of past experience and of mentally imagined likely outcomes. Foreign chemical contacts the tissue of our nose or tongue, chemical reactions occur that result in our sense of smell and taste. The chemicals that we encounter do not possess odor. The odor is not real. It is merely our perception of the chemical that has contacted our sensory tissue. It is the way our brain represents the chemical within our thoughts. When we smell rotten food, we have a repulsive feeling because those ancient individuals who did so were more likely to live long enough to have children than were those individuals who ate that rotten food. This is the reason we perceive an unpleasant smell when we encounter things that have consistently proven to be harmful through many generations. We share these experiences with our ancestors who lived millions of years ago. There is no sweetness in sugar. Instead, the sweetness is the reaction we have evolved to experience when we taste this food. The pleasant feeling we experience while eating sugar is meant to encourage us to do so. Throughout our biological past, sugar was found only in fruit and such. The molecules of sugar react with the molecules of our tissue in a purely electrical manner. Our conscious experience of odors, sweetness, and beauty are illusions created within our mind rather than actual physical properties of objects themselves or other molecules. This is the way of our mental world. Within our brain, the circuits that handle vision and other senses are intertwined with our pleasantness circuits. Dopamine is released onto the nucleus accumbens through a DNA-directed process whenever an animal is experiencing pleasure. We experience a pleasant feeling while watching a sunset because the regions of the brain that handle sight are also connected by neurons to the pleasure center of our brain. We can experience pleasure through any of our senses. Oxytocin accompanies the experience of love and adrenaline is released whenever an animal is experiencing pain. Since this occurs even in species of animals as ancient as the fish, it means that they are in fact experiencing emotions too, though they do not look like they are doing so to us. Mammals found it useful to communicate visibly their emotions to other individuals. Notice that little communication occurs between predator and prey. Communication is used for all other reasons. 
Why do we think certain people have beautiful faces? Scientists use a computer to digitally combine hundreds of photographs of faces. The greater number of photographs that are averaged together, the more beautiful we perceive the resulting face to be. Through daily life, we do this mentally, without even being aware of it. It seems inconsistent at first that the average can be the most beautiful, but it's due to an average arrangement of genes, and those have been making individuals that are among the most well adapt to environmental predators, food, and climate. An unusual face represents a genetic experiment. The most beautiful face occurs when the average face is altered to have a shorter than average lip to jaw distance, and lips are fuller than average. However, we are placing an undue emphasis on outer appearance since it results from a tiny portion of our genes. Only a few dozen of our 25,000 genes account for the differences in our outer appearance of people of all races. Basic emotions are happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, surprise, anger, sympathy, pride, embarrassment, guilt, and shame. These emotions are evoked by events that have been consistently present throughout the biological history of our species. Witnessing an emotional response today to an event that evoked it is like traveling back in time to observe the emotions and events that evoked them in our biological ancestors. You feel the same way during the same situation as did the ancestor one million years ago. Most of these emotions occur only in social situations. During the earliest generations of the primate social system, those individuals who could detect and respond to these behaviors in others were more likely to live long enough to reproduce than were individuals who were oblivious to these behaviors. Social animals have these feelings while non-social animals do not. Each emotion occurs through a DNA-directed release of chemicals during the corresponding situation. Notice that we feel these emotions one at a time, never simultaneously. A person does not have to be taught which emotion to have in a particular situation. This emotion is innate. We are born with these emotions and their number remains constant throughout our lifetime. We do not learn feelings and emotions any more than we learn physically to grow. You cannot invent a new emotion. We have names for many emotions that are different graduations of these. The intenseness of happiness goes from joy to ecstasy. Sadness ranges from discomfort to great depression. And disgust ranges from loathing to repulsion and contempt. Fear ranges from light apprehension or anxiety to intense panic or terror. Anger goes from mild irritation to rage. Surprise occurs during an unexpected event. Scientists most easily observe emotions in infants because their behavior is the least complicated. Their emotional reactions have not yet been altered by extensive life experience. At first, Innate responses control the muscles that create an infant's facial expression, but later we learn to control these muscles at will as we become able to act and pretend. Teenagers do not yet have sufficient experience to correctly recognize all facial expressions. For example, teenagers do not yet distinguish the facial expression of fear and anger. Do teenagers agree with adults about beauty? Teenagers do not agree with adults about the meaning of an expression. As you first see of the upcoming facial expressions, try to name the emotion being depicted. In an unexpected event, we show surprise with a wide open mouth. Chimpanzees do the same. We are learning every time that we are surprised. This person is pretty happy. A newborn shows happiness with an innate smile. Even when we are blind from birth, we still smile. An infant will get a sad face and cry in sympathy when another person cries. Love attaches us to other humans. Without love's binds, we would instead be lone individuals. 
If a child does not have the opportunity to form a bond with at least one adult during its first two years of life, then it will have trouble forming any social and affectionate relations for the rest of its life. It will whine and cling to anyone. This child will show an excessive desire for attention, and its future relationships will be superficial. It will show slow development and be withdrawn and depressed. This has been determined through many studies, some lasting 40 years and involving large numbers of persons. We use a protruding tongue and closed eyes to show disgust. We use wide open eyes, furrowed and raised eyebrows, and a stretched mouth to show fear. Even an infant shows fear when near a cliff or when hearing a loud noise. In our ancient past, loud noises were most often made by predators. The girl is about to see a ghost in a video. We show fear when faced with anticipated pain or danger. Later in life, we feel fear from an increasing number of events that we believe might cause us harm. For example, we might fear the loss of our job, our home, or our health. Fear does not produce pain. We use lowered eyebrows, eyes wide open with tightened lower lid, lips pulled back, and stretched lip corners to show anger. A child becomes angry when something has hurt it. The child might say, the ball hurt me on purpose. Feelings of anger, even in adults, always come in response to mistreatment. If you think of the last few times you were angry, you might be surprised to notice that each involved in the situation you felt you had been wronged or treated unfairly or unjustly. We get mad for no other reason. We show a small smile, but not a grin, a slight head tilt, puffed up chest and posture, arms are either akimbo or, in an extremely proud moment, held overhead. This is pride. A child is first seen to beam with pride for its own actions, but soon shows pride for the actions of his or her family and friends too. The more pleasure we have received from an individual, the more pride we feel for their accomplishments, and the more guilt we feel if we have caused their unhappiness. A child's social feelings of embarrassment, guilt, and shame first occur around age three when he or she has cheated in a mutually beneficial social relationship. A child will not feel guilty about not returning a borrowed item unless he or she had earlier developed good feelings about having similar items. The loss of an item will not evoke sadness unless that item had earlier evoked happiness. The intensity of sadness for that item's loss is related to the intensity of the happiness that item had brought. Our feelings are a bridge to the minds of our ancestors who gathered food, lived, and loved on the African plains more than a million years ago. Our feelings are precious to us. Our passions add love and meaning to the silent void of the universe. To lose them would return us to the amoeba. We know how each other person feels because we share humanness. We want to understand our feelings and emotions because we want to understand ourselves. As we come to understand how they are products of the evolution of consciousness, we are all more amazed by them. Brains combine senses, remember, learn, understand, and decide using nothing but chemistry and electricity. Our neurons store the moment-by-moment -moment collections of sensory information and search for cause and effect relationships between moments. An animal remembers the experience it has had with the rest of the world because it will live longer if each experience does not continue to be its first and if its understanding of past events can be used to predict what is about to happen in a new situation. Every human being that has ever lived anywhere on the planet shares these feelings and emotions. Others are not toy people, but thinking and feeling human individuals who are just like you and me and that they share the same desires and concerns for love and family and for community and justice. Each of us hopes for a pleasant future. 
We simply want to laugh and joke with our spouse, family, friends, and neighbors, raise children, and pursue life and the limits of our talents and passions. We expect our society to be mutually beneficial for all of us, and we will react against any unfairness or injustice in any interaction within our community. We all agree that the proper behavior between the family, friends, and neighbors of our society is to do as the other did, and to expect the other to do what you did.